Hi, I'm Bill Crystal. Welcome to Conversations. I'm very pleased to be joined today once again by Ed Conard, a scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, uh, author of the best-selling book, The Upside of Inequality, controversial book when that came out, I remember. <laughs> what was that, about five, six Love that. Yeah, a couple years, years ago? ago? Yeah. And a um, very successful businessman at Bain Capital and knows a lot about business, and I always learn from you because you actually started businesses and raised capital and didn't just study, take economics courses about it. So I always think you bring an excellent perspective for that and other reasons. Uh, I think the subtitle of your book, uh, The Upside of Inequality, was what? How Good Intentions Undermine the Middle Class. So let's begin with the middle class, because one thing you was struck by, we're speaking in what, beginning of May 2019, uh, everyone thinks the middle class has suffered terribly. The, that sort of Donald Trump says so, it's carnage in America, Bernie Sanders says so, even the kind of mainstream types in the parties are very concerned about it. I'm sure, what, what's, what's the story about that? What's the truth? What's the truth about the American Maybe middle class? Maybe there's some political advantage to, to making that argument. But if you look at the Congressional Budget Office, who does a pretty careful tracking of this, and they've grown more sophisticated over time, uh, they now can adjust for uh, how much taxes are paid, how much government benefits are received, so they can well, look at uh, income inequality after taxes, after uh, transfers. They say that between 1979 and uh, 2015, middle class incomes grew about 45 to 50 percent. And since 2015, they've grown about 10 percent, uh, surprising updraft since 2015. So from 1980 to 2015, middle class income. 45 sort of the to 50 percent. middle of the... Median income. Yes. It's gone by like almost 50 percent. 50 percent. Which is way from, don't you always hear, I always hear about income stagnation. And I think another 10 percent in the last couple years, so it's 60 percent. I always hear about middle class stagnation, and so what's... what's yeah, and I think generally people would say that that's about 1 percent a year under, they're underestimating because in the case of, say, cell phones, you don't really know what the price reduction in cell phones have been because there were no cell phones. And you now have a supercomputer in your pocket and the cost of dragging one around in the 1970s would have been astronomically high. So they really can't estimate how much value something like a cell phone has added. And so I think generally people believe about a half a percent to a percent a year. They're underestimating the true increase in prosperity. Over time there was something called the Boskin Commission a while back where they tried to make that estimate. and and that's the number they, they came up with. So it's probably significantly higher than the 60% that wow. the CBO suggests it is today. And so why does everyone think it's been flat for 30 years and all these things one hears? Well, I think uh, it's slowed down. So don't forget we went through an enormously productive period in the 1950s, 1960s. That slowed down more than people realize in the 70s and 80s, uh, mainly in the 1980s and early 1990s, and then there was a uh, rejuvenation in the mid-1990s with the beginning of personal computers and the internet. That's, I think, 1993 is when the internet was commercialized. And we've seen enormous growth in the United States relative to other high-wage economies since uh, 1995. So an example, I think if you go back to the 1980s, the U.S. was, the median household income was about 18 percent higher than Germany. Today, it's almost 30% higher than Germany, I think 28% higher than Germany. So we have seen accelerated growth relative to the European middle class. And when I use uh, Germany or Scandinavia, if you look at uh, test scores, for example, they have much higher test scores in the United States. So it's really not an apples to apples comparison. If you really wanted to make a comparison, it would be more to Italy, Spain, and, and France, where our, uh, our wages are even higher than than they are relative to German and Scandinavian wages. But if you look at the average Scandinavian American, today is earning about 50% more than the median Scandinavian in Scandinavia. Um, <laughs> and if you look, if you really try to dig down deeper into the numbers, because Americans work more hours than the, the Europeans work, so if you want to get it down to an hourly basis, uh, on the surface, it looks about the same, but if you dig a little bit deeper and adjust for differences in test scores, um, for any given test score or level of capability, an American earns about 20% more uh, than a European does at the bottom end of the wage and skill level. At the high end, at about the 90th percentile, it's 50% more. Beyond the 90th percentile, it's, it's substantially more. Well, I mean, we should talk about the inequality question, which sure. is related to sure. that. But, in a minute, but I think by any measure, you'd say the United better. States is doing much better than uh, So why does it Europe not is. feel that way? or why? And what is the basis for the 
common statement, which I take it as some basis in statistics, or if not quite in reality, maybe that you know uh, incomes incomes of middle class incomes have stagnated for so long and so forth. I mean, what are, what what is that not capturing compared? Yeah, to so one other thing I'd say is this is all adjusted for inflation, adjusted for purchases. These are real increases, uh -huh. not uh, not nominal and and inflated increases. I think part of what happened is we came through the financial crisis. People lost a lot of confidence in. Um, the private sector, they're worried about growth because we had very we had the slowest recovery uh, since the Great Depression in the after the financial crisis. Uh, productivity uh, in the 20 years prior to the Obama administration was about two and a half percent a year, a little less than two and a half percent a year. It fell to less than one and a half percent a year. So in half in the eight years during the Obama administration, we've seen a little bit of increase now of late, but it's too early to tell whether or not we'll, we'll see an increase. So I think people grew concerned. We also hit a peak in 2000. Remember when the internet boom was, was really right. taking place. So we saw a peak in 2000. And so when you made comparisons relative to 2000, 2007 got back to about where 2000 was, a little bit below. And then we really saw a fall off in incomes. And it's taken a long time to recover back to where we are today. So year after year after year, you kept saying incomes are lower than they were 10 years ago in 2000 or 15 years ago in 2000, 2000 was because I think everybody, both politicians and the media have a vested interest in, you know, the sky is falling, you should watch my program, you should listen to me. They're always gonna make a comparison to the, to the highest point, the worst comparison they can possibly make. So they always make it to 2000 and 2000 is, is above the trend line. And what you see if you look at trend lines over time is as we get to the end of an economic cycle, we peak up above the trend line, then we go into recession, we fall below the trend line, then we grow again today where we seem to be significantly higher than, than trend line. We'd gotten back to trend line by the end of the Obama administration, but in the two years that President Trump's been elected, we were eight years into the recovery. We've seen large increases in employment We've seen large increases in wages and median household incomes. We've seen a 45% rise in the Dow, uh, and we've seen almost no rise, but 15 to 20% in Europe's uh, stock market over that same period of time. So America has grown a lot more optimistic and a lot more uh, prosperous than it, than it had been. So I think the recession, it, it, it shakes people's confidence. And I think a lot of what you see today uh, is fallout from the financial crisis. And, I think growth, you know, there's a great book about the morality of growth written by the former head of Harvard's economic department that says, well, you love your neighbor more, you're more cooperative. Uh, just growth has positive effects on, on the culture, which we haven't had for quite some time. Yeah, that's interesting. So you think, so the people who say globalization, automation, China coming into the world trading systems, which is all sort of 2000-ish, I would say, when it starts to really, when those things take off. Uh, social problems, the Bob Putnam, Charles Murray stuff about social the challenges, especially for working class Americans, that all, all of that may have some effect, I'm sure, but that fundamentally that's not, we're not living in a new world where suddenly we have to live with much lower productivity gains and much, much less well-functioning economy and so forth. You don't buy that, really. Well, I think people, when it comes to forecasting productivity, I think the whole economics profession would agree that it's been almost impossible to do and will continue to be impossible to do. So we saw a slowdown in productivity, and I think we do have to be fearful about whether or not that slowdown will continue. The history of productivity has been uh, what's called J-curve, so there's a slowdown, and then it takes time to cure cancer, it takes time to uh, come up with artificial intelligence, and then when those technologies are developed, and it can be a lull. Then we see a lot of add-on uh, innovation, which accelerates productivity, and then we have to invent the next big thing, uh, whatever that is, we don't know what it is, and there's a lull. So we, we might be in a period of lull. People, I do think, worry that maybe this lull could last a long time. We did see uh, enormous productivity coming out of the Second World War. Um, so you, mean you went through the Great Depression, you went through the Second World War, you had two, two decades of pent-up innovation, commercialization of innovation. And so when that all came through in the 1950s and 1960s, electricity, automobiles, television, uh, mass market uh, uh, products, um, you know, like hair, hair shampoo, things like mm -hmm. that, you saw an enormous increase in 
productivity in those decades that I think most people think is unusually high and can never be duplicated. So I think there's concern about that, but, but uh, I think there's reasons to be optimistic, optimistic as well. I would say this, though, I think that one thing that, two things that have changed. I think, one, the slower growth in the financial crisis makes everybody less confident about the future, no matter what the future prospects are. But I also think there's been big, demo, big shifts in our economy from where we were in the 1950s and 60s to where we were today. So back then we were transitioning out of agriculture. It was a very painful a transition. Remember, people went through the Great Depression during that time. Then you really had all the talented people in America focused on creating mass market products produced by mass market workers in big U.S. factories. There was no very little trade, very little uh, low-skilled immigration. And so the, the talent of America was focused on increasing the productivity of, of, of working and middle-class Americans. I think since that time, uh, there's been a lot of uh, low-cost offshore labor. So a lot of manufacturing moved offshore. That put enormous pressure on U.S. manufacturing to increase productivity. The productivity grew faster than the demand for manufactured goods. So we've seen the the manufacturing employment drop, the shift into services, it's much harder to grow productivity in services. They're spread out, they're harder to manage. You know, in a factory you can, you can get engineers to figure out how to make the product and invest the capital. And so we've seen historically much faster productivity growth in manufacturing, but the productivity and growth of manufacturing is not so valuable to employees anymore because there's not very many employees in uh, manufacturing. And then in the case of talent, we had all these technologies, personal computers, all the knowledge on internet and, and enterprise software and, and uh, emails that allow much more communication. Those really increased the productivity of our most talented people. And we saw a migration out of <coughs> collective enterprises, big businesses, to management consulting, Wall Street, to startups, where they'd say, I, my, my capability can be more individually measured. And so they, in some ways, left what they were doing before, engineering products and jobs for the middle class, and moved on to engineering products and services for other capable people. And I think the middle class feels that. There has been a slowdown in middle class growth. If you look at the most productive companies, Apple, all of its blue collar employment is outsourced. You know, you still have engineers at Ford, but they're designing jobs for Mexican workers more than they are American workers. And so a lot of the talent migrated to the coast. And so now you're left in Detroit saying, where's the talented guy who's creating a higher paying job for me? And I think that's going to lead to, on top of the financial crisis, in addition to it, it leads to concern, loss of confidence about what the future might look like for me and my children. There's other trends, too. I, I could go on and on on this, by mm -hmm. the way. But, you know, we, we, we saturated the population with education. We saw an enormous increase in productivity. Now we're testing everybody from kindergarten on. You know, it's, there's not a lot left for us to, to squeeze the lemon out of education. Maybe we can re-engineer it, but for the last 30 years, it didn't produce the kind of gains that we got when we educated an uneducated population and found a lot of people who grew a lot more productive when they got, when they got educated. And had been denied chances before because they were poor or they were yes. African-Americans or they were yes. you know, recent immigrants or something but like that. But I think that. the net gets better and better at, at picking those people up. We saw a right. huge migration to the city. Right. You know, I think that's a one-time increase in productivity off the farms into the cities that we're not, we're not going to see again. I think we've seen other things. We've seen an erosion in, I'll call it respect for authority, but there's people are less religious. There's more divorce. Uh, there's less participation in the workforce. You see more opioid addiction. This is at the bottom end where it's, people have a little more difficult time managing themselves. You don't see these issues at, at the most skilled levels. But that, too, is going to... It's going to grind at productivity gains. And the other thing I think you see as well is, is in services, a lot of low-skilled services require subordination. You're a nurse subordinating yourself, to the, subordinating yourself to, the, to the patient, if you will, or a sales clerk or, uh, or somebody like that. Women have turned out to be better at those jobs than men. Men were better at factory work and, and taking risks and being strong enough to lift a box and things like that. So the whole economy has shifted 
in a direction that's more difficult, I think, for an unskilled man to, to differentiate himself financially. I think that, that they felt all those they felt all those effects as well. And, you know, I think that, that has led to a certain uh, loss, less confidence in the future than probably is warranted given the historical track record, which has been, which has been much better than people realize. Yeah, so on the one hand, you're saying we actually are better off and including the people who, you know, seem to be, are somewhat relatively disadvantaged perhaps by all these trends, which, you know, in the modern economy, they are still better off, but maybe they feel less better off, either because they're less confident about the future, or they see people above them doing even better, or the kinds of jobs they have, and so forth. What about the inequality issue? I mean, there, there has been, is it true that there's been an increase in just inequality, basically? And So we've seen two bursts increases in inequality. One's probably false, the other's certainly true. Um, in not, the mid-1980s, we saw an increase in inequality, largely centered around the Reagan uh, tax cut, which really moved, I think, a lot of income from corporations on to people's personal uh, tax returns because the rates were lower. And so there was an apparent increase in inequality at the time, which I think today most economists mm, are pretty skeptical that there was actually an increase. And there was a, a productivity was slowing down in the 80s before it revived in the 1990s. We then saw a pretty sharp increase from 1995 to 2000. <laughs> That's really the commercialization of the internet. And two things happened. We saw a lot of growth in inequality, largely at the high end, the top 1%, and we can come back and talk about them. But we also saw some of the fastest growth in middle class incomes at that time. We saw, between, according to the CBO, between 1994 and 2000, we saw like a 17% increase in, in median household incomes during that time after taxes, after uh, government transfer. So we saw both a rise in inequality and an increase in uh, um, um, middle class wages. Then if you look at the, the top 1%, it's pretty much stayed at that level from 2000 till today. It fluctuates up and down a little bit, a little higher at the peak of the economic cycle, a little lower at the, uh, uh, in a recession. If you look at the 90th or 80th to the 99th percentile, which would be college graduates, if you will, relative to say the 50th percentile, would be a person with some college, um, maybe some, maybe not, but but a but a median income. You've seen kind of a gradual rise from the 1990s to today. I think they earned about 30 percent more today. They earn about 40 percent more, and part of I think this technology that enables. Uh, data and communications and computation has increased the productivity of the most talented workers. But I think what you find at the top 1% is a very different phenomenon, which is if you wanted to, most workers are limited by the number of customers they can serve. If you're a school teacher, you can only teach so many students. If you're a doctor, you can only w serve so many uh, patients. If you're a waitress, you can only uh, wait on so many so tables. Even if you're a better one, or at a superior establishment or you can earn hospital, more. you can earn more, but you're not going to earn orders of magnitude more, I suppose. Right, right. right. So I mean, how do you get to the top, uh, the 1% or even higher than the top 1%? You have to get to economy-wide scale. In the 1950s, getting to economy-wide scale, Ford Motor Company, you have to build a lot of factories, put in a lot of inventory, train a lot of dealers, have a lot of workers. Google, Facebook, you can get to a, a, a world scale and need no capital investment at all. I mean, you're cash flow positive. The companies that are successful are cash flow positive almost from the get-go after, the, after they're started. So that led to a lot more risk-taking by our most talented people. And, you know, it's ironic. You talk about uh, business startups, how they've slowed down. What's really slowed down is mom-and-pop restaurants and, and retail establishments, of which there's many, many in the numbers. If you really look at our most talented people, and uh, the, the startups that they are do producing. These are small startups that grow large. That's what you need to really grow the economy. There's been, was a sharp increase to 2000. That was a peak way off the line. It took a while to recover. We're past the 2000 peak today. So because of this phenomenon, this lottery-like phenomenon where uh, you have a chance to scale to economy-wide success and need very little capital and investment to do it, you largely need talent and good ideas. We've seen a lot more and luck, maybe. Yeah, luck. You need a lot of luck too. But you've seen a lot more risk taking by talented people at the top of the skill level. 
That's produced institutions like Google and Facebook and Silicon Valley. That gives American workers exposure to cutting edge uh, ideas. And we know that when you get exposure to cutting edge ideas, the payoff for risk taking and the payoff meaning the probability of success and the value of success, the two multiply together, that's what we call the expected value before you've taken the risk, is much, much higher in the United States than it is in Europe, where you know cutting edge company is working for BMW in the auto industry. You have a difficult time in the United States recruiting people into the auto industry because they're all out in Silicon Valley working on technological innovation. And they're willing to do it, by the way. They're willing to take a pay cut to do it because of the entrepreneurial possibilities after they've gotten the exposure to cutting edge ideas. So what ends up happening here in the United States is a small amount of taxation on a really valuable opportunity doesn't discourage anybody from taking really valuable opportunities. At the margin, you're definitely discouraging because you're saying that could have paid twice as much, now it'll pay you know, one times as much if you tax it at 50%. In Europe, if you don't have a good idea, you can tax it at zero. And no one's going to take the risk because they say, I'm, I haven't had the exposure to the cutting edge ideas. And so what you see is a positive feedback loop that has formed in the United States, taken hold. We haven't seen it in Europe. We don't see it in Japan. We're hoping we might see it in China, although we're scared of it in China, you know, using it to come after us. But we, the rest of the world's contributed almost nothing to innovation. And in the United States, what we've seen is exposure to cutting edge ideas ramps up the amount of risk people are willing to take. They take more risk. They gradually produce institutions like Silicon Valley and, and uh, Google, which, which increase the exposure to cutting edge ideas, which increases the risk taking. And, it, uh, and you step back and look at it, the most talented Americans are getting better trained. They're working longer hours. They're taking more entrepreneurial risk. They're producing by some measures uh, uh, startups valued at more than a billion dollars, five times as much innovation as their counterparts in Europe. And they're doing it with a 8% of Americans scoring at the highest levels on academic tests versus 14% of the Germans and 18% of the Scandinavians. Oh, and our incomes, our middle class incomes are 20% higher. Their incomes would be even lower if they weren't benefiting from the enormous outsized contribution of U.S. innovation they to being Europe middle, and, and Japan. Uh, Europeans, but right. also middle class Americans, I guess. What I'm saying is when we make the comparison middle class Americans to Europeans right. without America's I contribution they of innovation, would even, they wouldn't Europeans would be even lower than they are. So you don't buy the argument at all that the decline in startups, which I guess is, or decline in new business formation, which I guess is true um, in some quantitative way, and the decline of labor mobility and other such things, is reflects like a decline of risk taking in America or something like that. No. That's a very partial, that's just a, as you say, fewer mom and pop coffee shops, but the, the important risk taking from a macroeconomic point of view is happening as much as ever, you think? I, I mean, think if you look at uh, venture capital investment, if you look at uh, the number of high tech startups, they, what are called high quality startups, so not restaurants and such, um, all those measures, we're at higher levels today than we were at the peak in 2000. And 2000 is, is well off the trend line. I mean, it's extraordinarily. And if you look at the quality of people were starting the camera shops, going to online camera shops in 2000, all that stuff you know, went bankrupt. Amazon, real serious competitors took over. The stuff that's being uh, created today is much more durable, much more interesting, much more sophisticated than what you saw in 2000. And you start factoring in like the amount of uh, R&D money that companies like Google and Facebook and Amazon and Microsoft and Intel, I mean, these guys have a close to trillion dollar valuations for a reason. This, what we're seeing today is, is way more valuable. And I think the second thing you saw see is because that talent was sucked out and moved to more valuable ventures, what's been left in the world of mom and pop startups is less talented than what it used to be because these other opportunities weren't available. Then we swooped in with, uh, because, because you, you've got all these guys who are working on technologies, they say, yeah, but I gotta have somebody to program my computer, I gotta have somebody to do this, to do that. That you've seen uh, community colleges swoop into the, the middle and find the most talented guys that weren't going off to college and say, well, you used to start, you used to you know, run your parents' Italian restaurant. Why don't you learn uh, computer programming or some sophisticated uh, how to program a, a machine or, or something like that? 
we've got we've pulled that group off. That was the group of sort of blue collar frontline supervisors. I think we've pulled them off and made them much more technical. And then what's swooped in behind them are companies like Uber, Walmart, uh, McDonald's, who say we can have a better uh, uh, management model for lesser skilled workers that requires less talent to manage it more effectively because we don't have the talent, because the talent's been pulled off. Um, and because automation allows you to do things today that it didn't. 20, 30 years ago. I Absolutely. Suppose. But I think there's a real opportunity there for, for people to come in with management models that don't depend on as much talent and manage it more effectively. So now you're going to start a mom and pop restaurant in the face of all the franchise and all the sophistication those franchises have. Yes, they still do it, but at a much, much lower uh, level than what has what had been done that had been done previously because the economy just over time is growing more and more and more sophisticated. And, and those opportunities just aren't there. Now, you know, it can change. <laughs> you know, something can change. Uh, we might be facing global warming and, and IT technology is not what's powering the economy in the next wave. And this is all very circumstantial, but we just happen to be in an IT wave that, that has transformed how we think about work. I, I'm reminded of a story. I read an article in the New York Times um, where a guy who ran a boiler plant makes boilers manufacturers boilers in the United States was complaining that he couldn't get the quality of worker that the, his competitor in the German boiler plant could get. And he was saying, look at how great their employees are, blah, 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 I can't compete with that. It's like, yeah, because anybody who was that capable wouldn't be working in your boiler plant in the United States. That's what job those guys are getting in Germany, working in a boiler plant. There's nobody willing to work in a boiler plant of that level of capability in the United States. They're all off programming computers, working in IT, or doing other, other more interesting jobs. And we know this from their, from their wages. And people you know, talk about the internships of Germany, how great the internships are. Yeah, well, the people earn 20% you know, less for the same level of capability on a per hour basis. Maybe that's not the way, maybe that's not the future. And why are they? So Stipulating this is correct. I mean, why is the? I mean, Germany's full of, or Scandinavia or anywhere else, is full of intelligent, well-trained workers. Apparently, probably a better education systems that we have all in on, in K twelve and not bad colleges and universities and certainly good technical schools. They have engineers. What? Why is it so lopsided by your account, at least in the U S. in terms of innovation and risk taking? And these, and especially the high tech companies. I mean, why isn't it more evenly? I mean, automobile companies, they're good French automobile companies, at least they were. I mean, now they're all globalized. But, you know, Renault is a good company, and, you know, BM. Uh, France hasn't created a new large company. But I was saying Germany had, in, uh, if you looked around the world in the 70s or 80s, you would yes. say there were great Japanese cars, there were great German cars, there were great French cars, there were great American cars, probably actually less good American cars. But, but it was like a global, you know, they were competitive, right? That is not the case with Apple, Google. And Amazon, right? There's yes. nothing really, not much that's equivalent. So why isn't there, what is it in Europe that discourages what happens in the U.S.? The tax rates aren't that different for wealthy people, I don't think. I mean. Yeah, I think it's, it's the tax rate multiplied by the value of the opportunity. So as I said, I don't think you can get exposure to companies cutting edge technology like you can in the United States. So at any tax level, they simply don't get the payoff to motivate them to leave their high paying job as a lawyer, as a doctor, where they're gonna make hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, retire with a couple million dollars. There aren't opportunities, even at zero tax rates, to make the kind of multiple of that that would motivate you to leave near certain success for near certain failure. Now, why did it happen in the United States? It might be happenstance. It might be- uh, Culture uh, of- Could be culture, it might be uh, uh, cheaper to lay off workers, so we were faster to transition. It could be more open borders that put pressure on our manufacturing and caused, you know, productivity to grow faster. Um, High-end immigration, which produced a non-trivial percentage of the people who started some of these no, no Silicon doubt, no Valley doubt about that. companies. Right. right. But whatever the reason is, we know this: higher payoffs have caused Americans to take a lot more entrepreneurial risk. And we also know that the tax rate multiplies directly against that payoff. So we can say, you know what, we're going to cut those payoffs in half. We can say, you know, we're going to cut those payoffs to 30% because we're going to tax 70% of them. So we, as a matter of policy, can decide how much payoff 
we want to allow for risk taking. Now, if you don't have good ideas, the tax rate doesn't matter. But right. if you're lucky enough to have ideas where the tax rate matters, like we have in the United States, then the tax rate matters. And but so does it so much? I mean, I do sort of, I'm half convinced by the liberals, moderate liberals, I should say, who say, oh, come on. I mean, is, uh, is someone not going to start Apple because it's a 50 percent tax rate on incomes above 10 million as opposed to 40 percent? Or, I mean, are we really capital gains goes from, I don't know, you know, 20 to 26 or something like that? I mean, is that really going to change? I mean, isn't there a pretty big band that probably doesn't affect risk taking? That risk taking pays off so well if it really succeeds yeah. that there's a, you know, there's less direct kind of one on one. Uh, reduction of risk taking if you hike taxes a bit. Clinton, well, say, Clinton say, hiked taxes a bit. We had a huge internet boom, I guess, right? I mean, you know. Yeah, so I think, I think two things. I think it's pretty, from my perspective, it's pretty clear that payoffs matter. The payoffs in the United States are higher. We get way more innovation than Europe, probably five times as much innovation because the payoffs are matter. We know that the payoffs are higher in, in California. Even though the tax rates might be a little bit higher, the payoffs are a lot higher. And people flock to California, and they take a lot of risk in Silicon Valley. But doesn't that, that cut the other way? Because the tax rates in California are higher than the tax rates in Tennessee or something. Yeah, I just think that the payoffs right. for risk taking are enormous. And then we slap a small tax on, and I'll come back to the tax. So, OK, tax risk taking is reduced a little bit, but from an enormous number. And when you really look at the calculation, what you see is, the payoffs are high enough to encourage people to take the risk there. You don't see it in Kansas. You don't see it in Germany. You see it you know, in places where the payoffs are high. So I would contend to you that whatever the reason is for the higher payoffs, the higher payoffs are causing more risk taking. Now, economic policy just decides what payoff you're going to allow. So you can say, I'm going to cut all the payoffs in half. I'm going to cut them by 10 percent. I'm going to cut them by 20 percent. It's hard to believe that cutting them, you know, if you cut, it's a little scary, I think, to do this. Cut them a little, doesn't have much effect. Let's round to zero and say no effect. We'd say, well, what if we hit it with a 50 percent tax, yeah. which is kind of close to 35 percent is probably about what we're hitting it with. You know, is that going to, at the margin, if you stack up all the ideas, you hope that you have the luxury of so many great ideas that even if you cut the payoffs by a third, it doesn't really cause uh, that much reduction. It's hard to believe, though. I think anybody in economics would say that they are stacking up both exponentially at the margin, and then there's a couple ideas that are so great, okay? But also, they're power law distributed, and I think every venture capitalist knows, every investor knows, uh, that a small number of home runs at the highest end is what generates virtually all the returns. So even if you say, look, at Bill Gates didn't expect to be a multi-billionaire, so what we're going to do is cut off the tail at the high end of the power law distributed curve, you're basically cutting off all the return that drives, if you look at the venture capital returns, they're, they're kind of mediocre. You know, Kauffman Institute does this. The returns have been mediocre in the United States relative to just investing in public markets. So, so if you, you want need the high to, return, not so much for Bill Gates, but for all the investors at the beginning to make up for all the other startups they've invested in that, but, don't, but more that don't pan out. I'd say this. Don't kid yourself that the loan genius is the real driver of productivity. We tend to look at the Bill Gateses of the world and the Sergey Brins because <laughs> they created you know, billions and billions of dollars. They created lots of hundred millionaires along the way. Right. That's part of the reason their idea was so valuable that they created an army of risk takers who were willing to go out, quit near certain success, for near certain failure to try to make their, their ideas work. And what we've seen in the after, and, and we know this, we know that Europe and Japan have way more engineers and scientists per capita than the United States does. They are very short on MBAs. So it, you know, it seems to be a blend of the two that matters, and that it's not some lone genius scientist. Right. It is an army of money-grubbing business people who are trying to make that, that idea successful. And in the aftermath, of Bill Gates and, and, and Steve Jobs, what we have seen is a gigantic army of risk takers form in their wake. So we could say, you know what, we'll just cut Bill Gates and, and all these guys down to $10 million. Would we have seen the army that we saw? Well, we know this. Europe didn't see the army. Japan's never seen the army. Something happened in the United States. I'll contend to you, it's the big payoffs that caused people to get very excited and to even take reckless risk. And I'd add one more thing. You mentioned investors. 
Investors can diversify away what's called unsystematic risk, company-specific risk, okay? They just own a lot of different investments. An employee can't do that. They're working, their life is invested in the company. What you want is talented people to take an enormous amount of risk, to quit, to not become a lawyer, to not become a doctor, to not become an engineer, to go off to business school and then go or wherever, probably a combination Skip business of two, school, right? And go, that's right. And, but, but I'm talking about leave, walk away from near right. certain success. Right. And do something very entrepreneurial, tr presumably to make... 10 times more than they could have made because it's probably a less than a 10% chance they're actually going to succeed. It's probably more like a 1% or 2% chance that they're going to succeed. So if you want that to work, those guys are, are even more than investors depending on the, the, the power law distributed end of the payoff because even investors who are diversifying company specific risk away don't get good returns without the home runs. The employees who are facing companies, the entrepreneurs, the talented employees who are facing company-specific risk are facing way more risk than the investors are. You'd have to think that they need even higher returns in order to motivate them. And for whatever reason, we do not see any motivation across all of Europe. We don't see it across all of Japan. We're beginning to see it in, in China. Uh, but we're, we're the, Un the United States is alone, is unique in this. I would contend to you that it is the payoffs that drive it, and it, the tax rate simply multiplies against the payoffs. So if you go out to California, I think you actually see the reverse, or New York, that what happens is the amalgamation <coughs> of people, right. uh, uh, the community of experts is what you'd call it in, in economics, has enormous synergistic value that magnifies the payoffs. Right. That allows you to put a tax on it without slowing the growth too much. But it's the very uh, success that allows the taxation. Now, if you're in somebody else in the United States or in the rest of the world, what do you think about California being the guy who can exclusively tax Silicon Valley? It slows down the growth in Silicon Valley and it affects the whole world. Oh, are the education outcomes better in California because of the taxation yeah. they put on the internet? You know, have they created better housing for middle class workers in, in San Francisco as a result of the taxation of the, of, the, of the technology that's driving the growth in the entire world, driving middle class incomes in the entire United States? Is, is, are we seeing better educational outcomes here in New York as a result of it? No, it's all going into the pocket of municipal, municipal union workers. We, you know, do we have better infrastructure in New York because of the higher tax rates? Are poor people better off in, the, in New York because of the higher tax rates? I don't think we see... If we were getting the results, it would make sense. But I think it's reverse causation. It's the value of the synergistic community that allows you to put the taxation on. In the same way, the good weather of California allows you to put the taxation on. The fact that New York was a port allowed you to put taxation. There were, there were assets that were extremely valuable to the United States, and you could put taxes on them because they were so valuable. It doesn't mean it didn't slow the growth. It just means that you could get away with it. Now, if people were benefiting from it, I think it would be marvelous, but we, it's shocking how little benefit we see from it. I, mean, I suppose in Europe they would argue they do have some benefits. They have much better trains and, I don't know, some infrastructure and public services, allegedly. Um, yeah, I think what you really see, though, in Europe is two things. For any level of capability, 20% less pay, and their companies are providing 20% less employment per worker. So 20% less hours, almost the difference between full-time and part-time. So if you live in that environment, France hasn't created a, a large company, based right. one large company in 1990. Otherwise, they created you know, a, a cell phone company in the 1970s. Complete stagnation. What you want as a middle class and working class worker, okay, the talent of, of, of mankind's talent is unevenly distributed. You want the same thing that a capitalist wants, which is we want the maximum amount of value from our talent from the least amount of cost. That's what every capitalist wants. That's what every middle and, and, and working class worker should want. And they should look at that and say, all we're really debating with Bernie Sanders is what price do we have to pay that talent to get them to produce the value that raises our wages? Now, I think every economist would agree. You know, I wrote in my first book uh, that, that you have to create five dollars of value to put a dollar in your pocket. I said it's probably more like 20. But I'm going to say five because I don't think any liberal economist will disagree with five. And then in my calculations, I use three and a half. They 
The book ended up on the cover of the New York Times Sunday Magazine because Mitt Romney, my partner, was running for president. And they said, this book depends on 20 times that an investor has to create 20 times the value, $20 of value to put a dollar in their pocket. They went and got Dean Baker, leading liberal economist, to dispute the 20, and he said, no, I certainly would agree with five. Okay? Right. They made the very point in the book, even though, uh, even though in the article they were misrepresenting what the, what the book said. So if you have to create five dollars of value for other people to put a dollar in your pocket, what we're trying to do is get the most talented people to go get the training, work the hours, take the entrepreneurial risk that puts money into our, into our pockets. We're just debating what price is required to do it. And we would say, well, the free market's a pretty good measure of what that price should be. It thinks the price needs to be very, very high. Okay, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren says, no, we could slap it with a 70% tax, and it won't affect middle class wages. It won't affect the growth rate. And all, we say, well, there's not a lot of data in the world, but let's go see where we have data. Let's check Germany, for example, where the payoffs are lower. What and we find is, is, is a very different outcome. I don't know how you look at that outcome and don't get very scared, because once you go down this path, you have to be very worried. You can never really recover from this path. It's not like you go, oh, well, let's just slap it with path? a 70%. the path of slowing the growth. So you slap it with a 70% tax. Right. You end up 20 years later, we look a lot like Europe. And they say, oh, geez, that was a big mistake. Let's go back to where we were before. There's no, Germany cannot, Europe cannot yeah. recover from what they did. There's no going back. They're not going to catch up with us in information technology. I mean, the decades they might. But over the next 20 years, they're not going to catch up with us. It's not like they can just cut their tax rate and go, oh, yeah, there goes the growth rate. We have all the institutions which are required to be successful in this information-driven world. They have none of the institutions. They have none of the culture. The people aren't trained right. They're, they're, they're in manufacturing, for God's sakes. You can make that stuff for $3 an hour in China. You know, we've long since said, let's move on and get to stuff with, that will add more value. Why? And, and they assert this with a level of confidence. But they have no business. It's a reckless level of confidence. Given the data that we have in the world, you look at the rest of the world and say, why would I even take a step in that direction? And as long as I'm on this rant, I'll add one more thing. We took a step in this direction after the financial crisis. We got the slowest recovery since the Great Depression. We got the lowest productivity levels, you know, 1.5% a year, down from 2.5% before. Uh, less than 1.5% a year, down from 25 before. We saw anemic uh, capital investment relative to what we saw in 2007, 2006, 2005. We've never, we're not going to recover from the eight years of slow growth. We've had a tremendous social unrest as a result of it. And what we've seen in two years since, but I'm not trying to give all the credit to to President Trump, nobody can get credit that fast, but we did see an enormous rise in the stock market eight years into the financial, eight years into the recovery. Normally, the stock market tops out eight years in the recovery, 45% increase in the stock market over the last two years. I mean, that's, that's extraordinary. Eight years into the recovery, we have seen 250,000 people get employed every month. You wouldn't think there's any people left to employ. They're coming out of the woodworks. We're finally, after all this time, once again seeing wages and middle class incomes rising at the rate we want to get them to. It, it's, 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 it's reckless to have the level of confidence that these people have when you look at the real world evidence that's out there. So I guess when someone says, what a sort of intelligent liberal says, look, a lot of this is network effects. It's Stanford and Caltech. It's you know having an attractive place to live. A lot of this shows that you could afford higher tax rates, that a lot of it is public investment and perhaps education. And uh, I guess the counter argument is that the culture you're talking about, the culture of risk taking, which does seem very important. I mean, it is kind of amazing when you step back and look at it from 30,000 feet that all these Stanford graduates want to start, do startups. And they don't have to do that. As you say, in most countries, if you're a graduate of a prestigious university, and in the US in the old days, I would say, you wanted to be a member of a reasonably, of an elite lawyer, phys you know, whatever. But it wasn't particularly risk-taking necessarily. You just well, had a good, a good upper risk. middle class job and an elite. And I do think the question is sort of what in America contributes to that extraordinary, apparently, willingness to take risks. And you're saying you don't want to, ri one thing that contributes is the outsized returns. I well, mean, it's the success of other people, right? I think you'd say, it's, uh, I I'm not getting status as a doctor in the United States. I don't want to go to medical school. I'm not getting status as a lawyer in the United States. I want. I have to right. go out, start a company, be quite successful in order to gain 
uh, the status, but I, I'll only say this about the network effects, which I think are very, very powerful and important, and, and the synergistic community of experts and the institutional capabilities. The argument is that those things grow gradually and slowly over long periods of time. And that what matters is at the margin, are we growing slightly faster? Because that compounding over 20 years creates the difference between the United States and Europe. And what we saw up to 1995 is Europe catching up, Japan catching up to the United States after World War II. It got to about 80% of the United States, and then it was completely unable to shift into the new information economy. And the reason is because it's talented people aren't motivated to get the training, work the hours, and take the entrepreneurial risk. And that didn't happen overnight in the United States. It's happened gradually over 20 years. And now with the institutions and the networking effect in place, now we have much better ideas. And now the payoffs are much higher. And now we simply decide how much we want to reduce the payoffs through taxation. And I would contend to you that every step in the direction towards Europe is a step towards lower middle class prosperity. And where we have seen heavy taxation in San Francisco, in California, in New York, has not resulted in a more prosperous middle class, working class, or poor. If we saw genuine results, if we could find a place where heavy taxation was leading to higher middle class incomes, I'd be, all, I'd be all for it. I mean, I think the estimate, my rough estimate would be this, which is if you look at the, how much an African American earns versus a, a, a white American, it's about mm, a little less than 40, 40-ish percent, I think 60, 65 percent, that after taxes and <laughs> uh, uh, redistribution, it gets into the range of about 20 percent rough estimate. 20% gap. 20% gap. Maybe it's a little bit bigger than that, but in that range, that's about the range where we are relative to Germany hmm. uh, adjusted for, uh, you know, skill levels on a per hour basis. So, you know, our African-American population is doing about as well as a middle class German uh, population is. Why anybody would want to step. Show me some place where somebody has been made better off by stepping in that direction. And I suppose... I want to challenge you in sort of two fronts, but I suppose one other thing one could say, and that would, I think, fit into your argument, is the things that have really taken off in the U.S. were among the less regulated parts of the economy, partly because they were so new, so the, and they yes. also were sort of, you know, up in the air as opposed to digging into the ground, so there wasn't pollution, and there, were, there wasn't thought to be pollution, and there wasn't thought to be all the obvious things that were slapped onto old industries in the 60s and 70s especially. Um, which also would make a case for... Yeah, no taxation because you're basically expensing all the your investment, which is talent, as opposed to, say, capital, where you're going to depreciate it over 20 years. So right. really much lower tax rates. I mean, it's funny that everyone in Silicon Valley is like, cheerfully liberal and wants all these things. But, of course, they don't want it about their, their own companies. They forgot. There are not a heck of a lot of them that are unionized. There are not a heck of a lot of them that have huge you know, compliance costs with EPA and with OSHA and with... No, and, and more importantly, they did the very thing that I think the whole economy is doing. They said, we don't want to be in the business of supervising blue-collar workers, and they outsourced all of it. Not only, you know, outsourced all the manufacturing of, of, of iPhones to, to China, uh, but you look at who's cleaning the floors and who's serving them in the cafeteria, Back in the day of Ford Motor Company, those would have all been Ford Motor Company and employees in a collective enterprise. They've shed all those workers. I mean, it is pure, smart guys working with smart guys, leaving everybody else behind. And what you find on, on iPhones, I'll contend to you, is a whole bunch of people playing games and doing social chatting and looking at Instagram and a small number of people who are making uh, 150 emails aimed at making money every day, day after day after day after day. It's incredibly valuable for the most talented, for the most talented people. So the truth is, they're creating technology for the most talented workers. Everybody else is benefiting from it, uh, somewhat. But over and over, these companies, Microsoft, Google, uh, 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 Apple, it's technology for the most productive workers, making the most productive workers more productive. And in an economy where talent is your binding constraint, because if you're an information economy and you need talent, talent's going to be your binding constraint. We know capital is not binding. We are eight years into the recovery and the interest rates are 2%, okay, almost zero. 
because capital is not the binding constraint in today's economy. It's talent and getting the talent to take the risks that are required to grow the economy. And that taking the risk part, we got there's three. We don't even have a shortage of talent. We have a whole bunch of people that want to study art history because they're rich enough to get away with it. And you say, how about studying accounting? And how about you know rolling your sleeves up and studying market marketing and serving customers one customer at a time? And they go, ah, oh, you got to be kidding me. That is not what we get our a lot of our talented people to learn in in college. We get some of them to go to be engineers and accountants and to do the tedious, arduous work that's required to really serve customers, grow the economy, and then we get a small subset of those guys to take the risks that actually produce the innovation that makes us all more prosperous. It's actually not a shortage of talent, it's a shortage of talent willing to take the necessary, willing to get the training, do the work, and take the risks. That is a small, small subset of America's talent. So you know if you read my books, I'm sure nobody has, but Best-selling book. What do you I mean? I want you people know, to right. it. It's, it's, it doesn't take much to be a best-selling book. I want talented students to feel a moral responsibility. You got were lucky enough to get the God-given talents. You have to put those talents to work, serving your fellow man. Now everybody goes. Oh, I'm going to do something great. I'm going to help my fellow man. I'm going to help him in charity. And every day you wake up, go to work, and serve your fellow man as a customer. And so you have great intentions that you never follow through on. You roll up your sleeve. You serve them as customers. We need our most talented people to feel a moral responsibility to roll up their sleeves, serve customers, create five dollars of value for every dollar they put in their pocket. It's not enough to just be smart. You have to get the training. You have to do the tedious, arduous work. You have to take the entrepreneurial risks that help your fellow man prosper and grow. And it, it, the cascading effects of this are enormous, by the way, and I don't know the statistic, but if you look at poverty in the entire world, yes. there has been a massive reduction in poverty since the 1990s when all of this started. And it is largely driven by the United States uh, driving the innovation, leading the way on putting the rest of the world to work through through uh, international trade. You know, no, I very much, I, mean, I always try to make this case too. I mean, that plus, I think, a U.S maintained and supported global international order, which has minimized big wars in East Asia, which has provided basic structure of security, basic structure of pretty free trade and movement of capital, and the ability to outsource labor, which is all of which together, I mean, they deserve the credit, the Indians and the Chinese, and they made big changes in their policies, incidentally, in the late 70s and the early 90s, it I had guess, enormous in India, and which had no, but that combined with the, our ability to help you know, make that possible, I guess I would say, so they're not having massive wars and so forth, um, or and also protectionist kind of, you know, uh, efforts and mercantilist policies. Uh, yeah, people just wildly underestimate, I agree with that, the moral, the moral achievement of a billion people coming out of poverty in about 20 years is not like a trivial one in human history, <laughs> yes. you know, so. Yes. Okay, so here's my, so oh, by two the way, counter arguments. Just, can I say one other thing yeah, there? Yeah, sure. Which is, uh, we paid for all the, the defense, Right. Europe freeloaded on it. We produced all the innovation. Europe freeloaded on it. Oh, by the way, we paid all the profits in healthcare, all the drugs, all the medical technology, and they freeloaded on all that. And they still didn't contribute anything. Okay. What I tell you is I'm not, I'm not here to critique Europe. I'm here to critique the let's go step in that direction right. arguments which go on, and there's no risk to doing it, and there's no cost to the middle class of us stepping in those directions, and all we got to do is tax success, and the middle class is going to be better off, even though we can't find a single example in the whole world where it's true. Okay, so tapping into my inner social democrat or whatever I have, such as I have it, um, uh, I'd say two things. So first of all, you mentioned the financial crisis several times as this totally exogenous event, but it was caused by things, presumably. And some people would say, and this is rather conventional, I would say, liberal view or lefty view of it, uh, you know, we diverted a huge amount of talent into pointless kind of paper shuffling in, Wall, shuffling in Wall Street, a huge amount of efforts to reduce, allegedly would make capital markets more efficient, but they were made like more efficient in a very, very marginal way. And eventually we channeled all this talent into such a desperate effort to maximize returns or to, you know, keep arbitraging arbitrages yeah. of arbitrages that you ended up with this massive financial crisis. So isn't that sort of the downside of, uh, of, of I mean, you, the Silicon Valley and IT seems yes, like a happy yes. talk story, am, yes. but isn't the finance capital side of it the sort of yes. dark side of that? So, no. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Did I make the point? Yes, I, yes okay. you made the point very, very well. Okay. And, and I think it's a very powerful point, by the way. 
and I think it's important to hear the rejoinder to the point as good, well. Good. Prior to the financial crisis, we were running trade deficits of 6% a year. So we were flooding U.S. capital markets with risk-averse savings. Now, but part of the reason for that was because Germany and Japan and China, which were all manufacturing-oriented companies, countries, economies, and you remember what's happening in the United States, productivity is growing faster than demand for manufactured goods, so manufacturing employment is declining. And you have to go to, a, you need entrepreneurial effort to move to other sectors of the economy, create them, create the jobs, et cetera. They, they continued down the path of manufacturing, and the solution to their problem was to export manufacturing to the rest of the world, which accelerated the demise of manufacturing in the United States, not only by pushing the jobs overseas, but also by accelerating the productivity gains that were required to keep the jobs here. Okay? But the flip side of that is that once you get all this American money, from buying uh, cars from Germany, okay, you have to take that money. It's IOU a dollar of U.S. labor. You either have to buy a dollar of U.S. labor, which balances trade, or you have to buy assets. And they were very risk averse, and they said, I don't want to buy an entrepreneurial startup. I don't want to invest in venture capital. I don't want to take any risk that grows the economy. It's very risk averse savings. I'm going to buy government guaranteed debt. So we had this huge flow, 6% of debt back in to the U.S. economy. Now, if, if, if I run a trade deficit, in effect the following, I fire a worker because he's not saving, and I go, I'm gonna hire a, Jap a Chinese worker or a Japanese worker or a German worker who saves a very high percent of his income, and that money's gonna flow back into the United States. I then have to borrow and that dollar money. dollar-denominated yes. debt or whatever. And I'm gonna have to borrow that money, take the risk of putting it to work, to re-employ the person who was laid off as a result of the trade deficit. So what's missing in the understanding here is somebody to keep the economy in equilibrium has to take a lot of risk. Bear with me for a second, okay. The Wall Street was, and there's something called, what I'll describe as a Keynesian paradox of thrift. What happens in a recession, and what can happen in the circumstance I just described is that I get very fearful in a recession. I say, oh, the world's coming to an end. Therefore, I'm going to stop consuming, right. and I'm going to start saving, but I'm not going to increase investment because I'm scared. And so savings are going to start to grow. Now, what savings are in a, in a corn economy is the silos start filling up with corn, except we don't have silos. You know, they're small. And so we say, start shutting down the fields, start laying off the workers. And so there's this concept of the paradox of thrift, which is if people start increasing their savings, reducing their consumption, and not investing the money, then it has a cascading effect, and you end up with a much smaller economy. So we have 6% of GDP flowing back in offshore that has to be, somebody has to take the risk and put it to work. Oh, by the way, we already know, here we are, 10 years after the financial crisis, the interest rates are zero, our economy is not capital constrained. Yes, it's called capitalism, because it used to be constrained by capitalism and the capital and savings. It's not constrained by savings anymore, and yet we have a massive flow of savings coming to the country as a result of the trade deficit. Okay. What Wall Street did at that time was say, they didn't, they didn't do this like as a matter of strategy. Business is all micro. Your head's down there. You're just trying to solve the problems in front of you. You don't see the macro effects, which is in some reasons why business people are dangerous guides to macroeconomic policy. They see a very micro view of the world. There was a business opportunity, and Wall Street went to, to go to work on it, which was how do you recycle 6% of the GDP back into the economy when nobody, no business needs any capital? Okay, they created uh, 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 syndicates to draw the money in. They created securitization to layer the risk. Uh, they created uh, subprime mortgages. Now, they get blamed for subprime mortgages, but keep in mind, as a, w homeowners are hiring Wall Street to raise money for them to buy a home. Okay, and Wall Street goes out and they talk to a German insurance company and they say, uh, my guy doesn't have any reported income. Will you lend him money? Yes. Okay? As a homeowner, Wall Street is doing the job they're supposed to do. They go, uh, how about they put no money down? And the guy says, yeah, I'll do that too. Uh, how about they, you know, they, they do this, they do that, and you keep saying yes, yes, yes. Their job representing the homeowner is not to represent the German bank who's, who's loaning the homeowner money. Their job is to go raise capital for the homeowner. So what they discover in the world was 6% Sorry, I've gone off on this tangent, but what they've discovered in a world with 6% flow 
is that there's the credit standards have eroded and they're working on behalf of their customer to get the cheapest, most flexible financing. You can buy a house, no money down, don't have to basically guarantee your income and you can rent, in effect, rent this house because you haven't put any money to the house. If it appreciates, you're gonna put money into your pocket and if it falls in value, you could walk away. You don't have no much a down payment invested in it anyway. Most of that down payment was made by a subordinated lender in a in a securitization. I know I'm getting very, very complicated. No, no, what I'm saying here is, is Wall Street solved a major macroeconomic problem. How do you recycle all this money into an economy that doesn't need capital? And what it found was that if you uh, go to a homeowner who hasn't gotten much of a pay raise in 20 years and say, I don't know if you noticed, but you have a huge amount of embedded equity in your house and you can borrow that, pull that money out and spend it. And oh, by the way, if the house drops in value, that would have come out of your hide because you're the last dollar, but now your equity is out of the house, so that's going to come out of the bank's pocket. They created a very valuable deal for homeowners and they solved a major macroeconomic problem for the United States. And they got paid a ton of money to solve it because it might have been our biggest macroeconomic problem in 2005, six, and seven. Now, what you want banks to do is to, is to think about credit risk. Can that homeowner pay back that loan? What you don't want banks thinking about is, is there gonna be a liquidity crisis? Because if they go, look, here's the problem you have in banks. You see it in the, what's that, that movie, uh, A Wonderful Life? There's no money in the banks. What okay. you want the banks to do is empty the corn out of the silos and loan it back to the farmers to get them to either eat it or plant it. So when everybody runs with their IOU, you owe me a bushel of corn, and they want it withdrawn from the silo, there is no money in the corn to pay okay. anybody the withdrawal. So the, the banks can go bankrupt for liquidity problems, not for bad loans. Right. So what we did in the financial crisis, huge mistake, I'm sorry we can edit this all out. And no, no, it's good, else, it's is, good. Well, it was a liquidity crisis, not a solvency crisis. Right, right, and we don't want banks in the macro business of worrying about liquidity because if they are, they won't make loans. The way you solve a liquidity crisis is fill the corn, the silo up with corn. The very thing that Which you, we did eventually. We, what we do now, and then we, and we faced eight years of slow growth as we you know, had right. enormous reserves put into our banking system. But my point being, Wall Street solved the major macroeconomic problem. They got paid a lot of money for it. We faced a liquidity crisis. We know banks are highly unstable. Uh, equilibriums because if you run to the bank you will not be able to get your money out and they will m Goldman Sachs was shorting the mortgage market and they're still going to go bankrupt from a liquidity crisis so they're making money from the short but they're still going to run out of cash to pay to pay the withdrawals you want them there's a very cheap solution to this and we've known it for a hundred years Federal Reserve steps in and says oh you want your money turn on the printing press here's your dollar you take your dollar and what are you going to do with it stick it back in the bank the bank takes it, they go, thank you very much, throw it in the incinerator. So better and policy it. in 07, early 08 Brilliant. could have averted it. It could did have averted the crisis. It did, well, did eventually, I mean, after a pretty nasty it's fall. Gonna, there's going to be nasty falls in this, in this the, in, when you get to this unstable equilibrium. Fed pretty much did what they did. What we ended up doing stupidly is we said, you know what, uh, we're going to uh, villainize the Fed. We're going to villainize bank bailouts. We're going to villainize Wall Street. And we're going to make it highly, highly, highly ineffective for the government to be able to, to crack, to solve in a low cost way, the next liquidity crisis. And part of the reason for that is because we tried to solve it in the middle of the crisis. What we should have said is, you know what? We're in the middle of a crisis. So let's just print, give the guys the money. We're not gonna let everything go bankrupt. We're not gonna let GM go bankrupt. We're not, it's crazy stuff that in one week of liquidity crisis, we're gonna let everything go bankrupt for 50 years. It makes no sense, okay? We just turn on the printing press, boom. Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look and see, did you have loan losses? Because if you did, we're gonna charge you every dollar for those loan losses, because what we want to hold you accountable for is that when you make a loan, that loan had better be paid back. You are responsible for credit default risk. You are not responsible for liquidity risk. Right. So we're gonna we're gonna watch you, Lehman Brothers, and sure enough, Lehman Brothers probably would have gone bankrupt. J.P. Morgan, the loan losses on I, I've tried to look, and it's very hard to find this data. The loan losses on Triple A, the real loan losses are like three, four percent. Yeah. I mean, if we had 20% reduction in real estate prices, you'd say the rating agencies in Wall Street actually did their jobs in that, in that situation. I know I'm taking a very unpopular position, right. but we don't have this problem anymore. I mean, trade deficits are now growing again, but they got quite low. 
Okay, Wall Street got paid a lot less money during that time too. It, you know, you see uh, uh, the vibrancy of Wall Street today relative to where it was in 2005, 6, 7. Do I think that we diverted- Much less today, you think? Much less. Yeah, yeah. And do I think we diverted a whole bunch of talent away from more productive efforts solving the problem we created by allowing the trade deficit to get to 6%? And by I'm saying allowing in my first book and in my second book, I say the following, which is the world suffers from a huge surplus of savings. The world solves that by dumping their risk of risk savings on the United States. And our workers pay the price of it. And our risk takers have to take risk of guaranteeing their risk averse debt instead of taking the risk of starting a startup. Why should we, America, allow the rest of the world to solve their, to allow us to solve their problem? That's what the counter argument is. They're paying for our excessive, for us consuming more than we actually save. Uh, or produce even, we run these massive deficits and the rest of the world finances them. So we're perfectly happy to take their savings because they're paying for all of us to have government services one trillion at one trillion, provided one trillion dollars more of government services than we're willing to pay taxes for. I think there's two ways to think about that, okay? So I think the one way is the way you described it, and I think the truth probably lies somewhere in between. So on one side you'd say, all we did was borrow a bunch of production from China and consume it. Right. Okay. That's, that's, that's and voila, party time for us. Right. The other way to think about it is, because I ran a big government deficit, I needed savings. So I fired an American and I hired a Chinese because that guy will save a lot more money, a lot more of his income than an American will. Now I've got the Chinese savings. And when I spend the money here in the United States by giving somebody a tax reduction or transferring money, then that worker gets reemployed. So I didn't get any increase on my side. All of the increase came on the Chinese side. So either not way, it's US. not friendly. I mean, you're not, in this case, friendly, particularly to the deficit. I mean, the deficits are not economically a wise thing to have. Well, I think two, two things. I, I mean, except in when so, you're in So really, really important point. If we borrow money and throw a big party, consume it, spend it, okay, then future generations are gonna to have to pay for the party that we had today. Right. We get the prosperity today, they get the bill tomorrow. I'm 100% against it, okay? There's a second way to think about it. Second, I won't say think about it, but a different type of borrowing. I borrow money, I buy a factory, the factory produces more income than the interest payment <coughs> on the debt. And, if, and when we pay back the debt, we're wealthier and, we, and it's a good investment. But let's say I never pay back the debt. Let's yeah. just say that I... It keeps I, rolling keep, over. Yeah, I keep rolling over and I keep reinvesting in the factory. <laughs> and when you look at all the calculations, I'm producing more income than the interest on the debt yeah, that so I borrowed. Yeah, so that's a plus. Sir. My children and future generations are made better off right. by the additional interest, not poor, by the debt. If you look at the Republican tax cut that was passed, which includes a couple of components, not only one, a business tax cut, which, which the Congressional Budget Office and all economists think will accelerate growth and accelerate GDP beyond what it would have because it will increase investment gradually over a long period of time. Second component is a middle class tax cut, which you could say, theoretically, we didn't need, it doesn't produce growth, produces enormous deficits, is the kind of party first problem, but very, very well have been necessary to get the very unpopular business tax cut passed, which most people are against, even though that's what CBO would say creates all the value. And then 10 years, and then there's, well, we, we reduce the health care mandate, which, which on a, saves more money than it costs. Okay, so that adds a little bit of, of, of money to this calculation. And then you roll the camera forward 10 years in the CBO forecast. And this is a forecast that assumed that nominal GDP would grow about $250 billion a year more as a result of the tax cut than, uh, than it was going to. Oh, by the way, they also forecasted, no, but it'll grow $750 billion more, but we're not attributing the $500 billion to anything, not the tax cut. Just We just happen to have a big increase in uh, optimism. Oh, by the way, we increased the optimism even more at a time when the rest of the world was slowing down because the results were even better than we expected. But leaving that out of the equation and just focusing on the piece in April of 2018 that the Congressional Budget Office said they would attribute to the to the business tax cut primarily. Then you get some short-term growth from uh, the stimulatory effect of the middle class tax cut, which goes away at the end when they take that tax cut away. If you look out in the ninth, eighth, ninth, tenth years, they're producing more tax revenues than interest expense, which means they bought a factory 
And they are now in a position where they're generating more tax revenues than they're generating an interest expense. That tax cut makes people better off. Now, we could have gone, you know, we didn't need the middle class tax cut. We should have just cut business taxes. We would have had no deficit, and we just would have gotten the increase in tax revenues and the increase in growth rate and the increase in middle class. And because if you look at where the tax cut, there's been distribution analysis spread pretty well across the tax brackets. Obviously, richer people get more because they earn more, but, but, but spread fairly evenly across the tax brackets. You get out to those eighth, ninth, tenth years, and the Congressional Budget Office says, we're going to generate more tax revenues than we would have without this tax bill. Right. And oh, by the way, that you know the 40% the increase in the stock market and the reduction in regulations on business and the general sort of emphasis on business over redistribution, for whatever unidentified reason, is going to give us another $500 billion in nominal GDP on top of the $250 billion we're attributing to the, the tax increase. Okay, I think that's a very different increase in debt than borrowing money and uh, redistributing it and consuming it and getting prosperity today at the expense of future generations. If I were in charge, if I was to rewrite the Constitution, I would say that in very few cases can you simply push it off on, push the costs off onto future generations. And there's some cases where you might want to do that, but you get complicated. Right. In general, I am opposed to that. I think it's a bad idea. I think the Congressional Budget Office sharpen their pencil and say, are we making an investment here that produces more income than the cost of debt? And when I say more than the cost of debt, by the way, they predicted what the debt would be 10 years from now. And they said that increase in interest I mean, they predicted the interest rate, and they predicted an increase in the inflation rate. So you got an increase in the interest rate, not only for inflation, but because it was more money being borrowed. And they said that delta multiplies by all the debt that's out there, not just the additional debt. They did the calculation the way you should do the calculation and still said it produces more tax revenue than the additional interest expense. You know, nobody hears that story. I get killed by, by uh, conservatives who insist that the, the first kind of debt is exactly to the second kind of debt yeah. and that I don't know how to read the Congressional Budget Office report. I have to get them out and go into the exhibits. You know, it's, it's, I've done it so many times. It's, 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 it's Exhibit B, Table 3 of the April 2018 uh, CBO budget, 10-year budget. Go look it up and see and go look at years 8, 9, and 10 and tell me if the cash flow statement doesn't show you that the revenues, tax revenues are greater, and tax revenues and cost reductions are greater than the interest expense. Okay, so you're less <laughs> alarmed. So you're, I mean, net net, it sounds like you're a little less alarmed about the rise of the deficit and, and the rise of debt I than hate the some idea. of the conservatives. Well, wait, we, w we went from, prior to the financial crisis, we were at about 33% debt to GDP. Right. You know, at the end of the Obama administration, we were at 75% debt to GDP. We did not get a rise in earning, additional earning capacity to cover the additional interest expense. So that was... That money basically got, you know, spent. consumed. Right. It did not lead to increased investment. We saw anemic investment. We saw anemic productivity growth. We saw the slowest recovery since the Great Depression. We did not see an increase in middle class prosperity. We did not see an increase in working class prosperity. We did get more generous at the lowest end of the income scale. And we took off a lot of the work requirements for uh, food stamps and some of the some of those uh, programs. So there was an increase at the lowest ed end of the wage scale. I would contend you that a lot of that comes out of the middle class because all of that comes. It reduces risk taking at the margin, which slows growth, which slows middle class uh, wage increases, which. That money land it does land in the pocket of the people in the bottom 20 percent, and the bottom 20 percent, you know, is largely people that don't work. Many who can't work, um, you know. I think this conservatives would tell you they all don't work because they don't want to. A lot of them, a lot of them have young children. It's, it's hard for them right. to work. A lot of them uh, have disabilities and right. can't work. They drug addicts, mental illness, all kinds of stuff down there. Yeah. Okay, what about equity and, and, and also social mobility? So are we just going to accept the pretty drastic increase of inequality? Not so much between, as you say, the 90th percentile and the 50th or 30th, but between the top 
and everyone else, A and B, how worried are you about the social mobility issue? That it's one thing it seems to be for these people, if we're, you know, everyone has a chance to become Bill Gates, yeah. and you know, and it's great, and this is America, and fine, so some people become wildly wealthy, but everyone's got a, you know, almost, have, well, at least enough, there's enough distribution of the people who have a chance that one feels that you're not hurt by being born into a certain class. And are you worried, but there has been some decrease in social mobility, right? Well, I think if you look, so my book looks at this very carefully, the, the upside of inequality. Um, I, I use uh, all the studies that are out there, liberal and conservative, but there's a lot of, lot of this is a very political issue, so there's right. a lot of politicking in, the, in what you think is the academic analysis. My conclusion from looking at it, and I tell you this, I'm, I want to be in the business of not spewing propaganda even though I have a point of view, any, anybody listening can hear it loud and clear, but I want the facts to be right, I want people to understand. So I try, when, in the books, I'm always trying to get my facts right, not take them out of context, show you, explain to you what the other side of the argument is so you can judge it for yourself. So I tried to go through, I used a lot of the Brookings uh, uh, inequality, I mean mobility study, to, to do my analysis. I think what you find is that the Mobility in the United States is virtually identical to Scandinavia, except for uh, the poorest 20%. And what you find in that poor 20% is a very high incidence of single motherhood, kills you in mobility. Very high incidence of high school dropout, kills you in mobility. Now, I'm reluctant to say it's simply a matter of uh, single motherhood and dropouts, which causes the lack of mobility because part of the reason why you're at the bottom is because high school is not that useful to you and, right. you know, it, you know, there's a lot of pressures on you to keep marriage together. Arguably, your, your mother said, you know, I'm better off without this, this guy than I am with him, so she might have made decisions which made you better, not worse. So, so I'm, I'm very sympathetic to liberal points of view about what's going on. But aside from that group, the mobility in the United States is basically the same. Hmm. If you look at the distributions of income, because there's another argument related to this hollowing out of the middle class, what you find is that the distributions of income are virtually identical, except for a little blip way out here at the top 1%, or the more you want to slice it, 0.1%, 0.01%, there's more and more of a blip way out there because as I said, you can scale to economy-wide success without needing very little capital, and we're seeing more success out there at the tail. But it's very, very small in terms of the number of people. The distributions are virtually identical, except they're shifting upward. In the book, I look at uh, white. So I'm looking at white full-time employees, because uh, I think you're not going to be middle class if you don't have a full-time job. It's a different issue. But I look at uh, white, not Hispanic, Hispanic, uh, African-American, and all three combined. Every single one of them has increased. Hispanics, the least, because you know, keep getting flooded with supply. Uh, I think I forget the difference between white Americans and African Americans, but, but fairly close. African Americans are affected, I think, by low-skilled Hispanic immigration that increases the supply and, and pulls, pulls the wages down. Virtually identical distributions. And when you read studies, like there's a Pew study that says middle class is hollowing out. It's gone from 61% to 50%. Right. The way they do that is they go, I'm going to bracket it with dollar bookends. Okay. Now, remember, people are getting richer, so they keep getting pushed off the top end of the bookends, and then they say, it used to be 61, now it's 50. So 11 points lost middle class. So I dug into those 11 points. It's seven points up, four points down. So seven points of the 11 I'll go up. of the disappearing middle class are moving into the upper middle class. Yes. So that's not a bad thing. Four points are moving down. Three of the four points are from an increase in Hispanic immigration. Hmm. Okay. So really, if you go native borns, it's one down, seven up. I think we'll take a hollowing out of the middle class at seven up, one down. And then we've added an additional three points because we've increased the population you know, below the median below the median wage with, with we have 40 million foreign-born adults, 20 million native-born adult children. That's 60 million. It's actually more than that now, 35 million of that 60 million. There's another 20 million children that don't work, but 35 of that 60 million are, are Hispanic immigrants, largely low-skilled Hispanic immigrants. So there's been an increase down at that, that end of the wage scale. But, but that's how you lie with statistics. You know, there's another report that just came out that said, uh, 
you know, big decline in uh, the middle class. Yeah, it declined in their measures from, I think they go from 75% above the median to 25% below the median. In that measure, it declined from 63% to 60%. And pretty, I'm not sure you can measure it that accurately, right. to tell right. you the truth. Right. And I think some of that is Hispanic immigration. I didn't look deeper into those numbers, but I'll bet you two of those three points are are from that as well, and some of it's going to be from moving up to the high end of the range. So I just don't think you see a hollowing out. But I would say this. You, it used to be that we didn't educate anybody in the 1950s. We said, you know, we, we put public education in the 40s and 50s. We started sending everybody to college on the GI Bill. As the baby boomers came in, we sent more and more people to college. We really expanded. We were ahead Huge of the rest of the world. expansion of state universities and so yeah, forth. We were yeah. way ahead of the rest of the world. And we were ahead of them because we started educating everybody in high school but before the rest of the, before the, rest of the high wage world did, before the whole world did. Um, high wage world followed, followed shortly behind us. Um, okay, today, so what we found then was a whole bunch of people who were uneducated and man, we educated them. They got a lot more productive. They turned into doctors, lawyers, engineers, boom, off the, off the charts. Okay, we saturated the population with education. We test everybody in kindergarten now. So how much more mobility should we be seeing as a result of the hidden mobility that we discovered right. by educating the workforce? We see a lot of assortative mating, which is people go to college, they met, meet people that they, you know, it used to be women didn't go to college. There was a lot more, a lot less assortative mating right. than you see today. There are many which other Which increases trends. inequality, obviously. If a doctor marries a doctor and a nurse marries a nurse, the income gap between those two couples will be greater than if a doctor marries a nurse and a doctor marries a nurse. <laughs> yes. Really? I mean, that's yes. how I think. And that is the case today, obviously, with yeah, so women having equal opportunity and half the people in medical school being women, you know. And then we saw other and, things as well. We saw people move out of collective enterprise, which I talked about earlier, into more individual-oriented uh, enterprises. That, uh, what that has caused is that you can have a very good year and click into the 0.1%. And then you'll click out, click in, click out. So if you just look at the 1%, the 0.1%, however you want us, the more you slice it, the more extreme it gets, by the way. What you'll find is, oh, geez, if I get it, slice it to the 0.01%, that's a guy who sold his business and made $20 million. He, he, so he clicks in and he clicks out. If you really try to look at lifetime earnings, yes, the 1%'s expanded, the 0.1, the 0.01, but much less than it appears to have expanded because it used to be in the 1950s and 60s, the guys that were in the top were on the top every year of their whole life. The distribution was narrower. Now what you see is people clicking in and clicking out. And so, so there's much more volatility who, who's actually in these very uh, little slices. So by some measures, there's been almost no increase in lifetime Inequality overall, I find it a little hard to believe because I do believe that the internet and IT revolution has allowed some entrepreneurs to get, and I don't mean just the Bill Gates of the world, there's right. lots of people who are benefiting from this. And also the removal of arbitrary barriers so that, I mean, you're going to have a huge amount of mobility when people who were unjustly kept out of opportunities, women, African Americans, or people who were just immigrants or kids of immigrants, and this is the first generation that went to college, and you have a massive expansion of that, those numbers, you're going to have a lot of upward mobility, obviously. Yeah. But that was, that's both a good thing and not a good thing. It's a reflection of a certain injustice and lack of opportunity before then, right? And in a way, a lot of that easy, let's call it low-hanging fruit, has been taken in, in terms of social mobility. Well, I, th I did. There was a recent Raj Chetty study, and when you dug into his data, as often as the case, you find find something different than what his headline is. But he did look at. You could look at immigrant mobility, and I think what you you know. When I looked at it, Asian, white, African, Hispanic, basically the kids ended up being, uh, even though they started off very, very poor, they ended up where the native-born averages of those demographics were in one generation. Wow. So, so that's good. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah if people are coming to the U.S. in the 70s and 80s and their kids are ending up in the same place as the people who have been here three generations, right. that would be a sign that the system right. is not... As resistant to mobility, I yeah. suppose. Yeah. I mean, I think capitalism is such you can't be. You're, I think there's a huge shortage of talent. You're looking for talent anywhere you can find it, and I think what you find is the GEs of the world who go, hey, we need uh, programmers to program machine tools, and things have gotten a lot more sophisticated. They're in the community colleges trying to recruit every remaining person that they can train 
and bring into the workforce. I think what you find is there's a large shortage of talent in the United States and people are working hard to fill the gap. So I don't know that you have a lot of people walking around saying, you know, I just don't like women. I think we'll just exclude them 100% from our workforce. I right. think you've got an opportunity to get smart, ta talented women. You're going to take advantage of that. You're not going to sit around and go, sorry, I don't do that. And that's why you argued, I guess we discussed this in the previous conversation, which people should also go watch or listen to, uh, that the, the case for sort of especially skilled immigration is so strong in terms of possible contribution to Well, yes, I, We're I, short I, of talent. I mean, we, we issue a million green cards a year. I, I do this calculation. I think I did it the last time, but I'll do it again, because yeah, I do, do think you know, we can cut the tax rate, do this, do that. It's going to have small changes at the margin and gradual over long periods of time. We can try to jawbone talented people into taking more responsibility. They're going to go in one ear, out the other. We can try to improve our education system, which we've tried to do for 50 years and have not done, have not seen much results. You know. We face two extraordinary challenges. The first is baby boomers retiring. We've already seen the debt go from 33 to 75, 80% of GDP. It's on its way to 150% if we don't have growth crushing tax increases to pay for the retiring baby boomers and the rising uh, medical costs that have gone along with us unless we find ways to control medical expenditures largely de by denying care like Europe does. But, but. Um, we face a big problem, and after we've been eaten alive by the baby boomers, which I'm one, sorry, uh, retiring, you know, then we have to worry about if China is as successful as it could be, we could face a major military threat at that time, and we'll be at our weakest point. So we need faster growth, and we're not going to get it with the kind of programs I just described. It's just not going to have a big enough impact. So we have a lot of 120 million full-time workers. The top 5% is 6 million workers. We issue a million green cards a year. In six years or 12 years, we could double the number of top 5% workers, which potentially could double our growth rate. Now, I don't know if one plus one is two or one plus one is one and a half, right. but you know, doubling the number of top 5% workers in, a, in an economy where uh, we have a shortage of talent, and all we have to do is take a talented person and expose them to the cutting edge ideas in the United States, and they will get a lot more productive for no other reason than just that. It's not like Google and Facebook and Intel and Microsoft and Apple said, oh, geez, we can't get the people. I guess we won't grow. No, they're Skyping all those people in from Romania and Eastern Europe and India and all over the world. So what's happening is, those people are creating jobs for teachers, uh, for doctors, for uh, truck drivers, for waitresses, and all those jobs are in Romania because Apple says, why in the world would I want to move that person to San Francisco and have to pay them enough money to cover their San Francisco rent when I can pay Romanian rent, which is one-tenth of what San Francisco rent is, but the middle class is losing all the jobs that end up in Romania, but Apple is not losing the employee because they're just Skyping the employee in on the phone. And, and building, every company's got skyscrapers full of talented people in other countries because they're not going to sit on their hands and say, oh, sorry, you wouldn't let me in. You wouldn't let the immigrants come that I need. Therefore, I'll just suffer the losses because I can't get the people. They can get the people. It's crazy that we're letting that we're letting that happen. And that is the one way. And what we need, when I think when it comes to immigration, is you want people who are paying a lot more taxes than they're consuming in government system. services so that you have that money to pay the baby boomers. And I think, I, you know, I grew up in Detroit. Guys were working in the auto industry. And I don't mean in the UAW, although, you know, I worked for Ford Motor Company. I knew plenty of guys who worked in the UAW. But most of my friends, I went to a school of 750 kids in my graduating class. 20% of them went to college. You know, you'd work in your dad's machine shop, working, you know, for a supplier of a supplier of a supplier of the auto industry, making a very high wage. Those companies, the auto companies move their manufacturing first to the Carolinas and then to Mexico. And those guys are left producing, you know, much lower paying jobs. Meanwhile, all the talent migrated to the coast, you know, so they're not there going, I'm going to start the business that's, that's, uh, that's going to put these these people back to work, you know. If you want to really boost that middle class prosperity, 
I think you have to saturate with much more talent. But that person is going, you know what? I need my Social Security. I need my Medicare because I didn't get to save any money as a result of having gone through this transition right. from manufacturing to the service economy. And now you're talking about uh, spending money on other uh, expenditures, fighting wars in the Middle East, lowering tax rates, all of that comes at the expense of jeopardizing my, my Social Security and Medicare, the very thing I need in my old age. So you talk a lot about the disruption of trade and such on, on you know, my life, but you're not really willing to do anything to help me. And the one thing you can do to help me is get me my Social Security and Medicare, and it's the very thing that we're putting in jeopardy. And I think they look at Republicans and they say, you guys aren't helping us, and they look at Democrats and they say, you guys aren't helping us. Elites on the left and the right, they, you are, we are not your priority, which is why I think they turn to President Trump as the guy who says, I'm gonna create a shortage of workers to drive up your wages, I'm gonna make sure that you get paid your Social Security and Medicare, I, I can't guarantee it, but I'm gonna go out of my way to not spend money on other stuff, even though maybe he hasn't delivered on that, on that promise. You know, my friends, they're not Republicans, and they're not, they're not, they were Democrats, I don't think they're Democrats, the guys, I'm saying the guys I went to high school right. with, they're not Democrats anymore. But you're, the true solution for those people is not kind of protectionism or, you know, a managed economy of a kind of semi-conservative sort. It really is just more growth, which then allows, the, uh, to use an unfashionable term, the, 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 the proceeds of growth, the, the consequences of growth to trickle down to the middle class and also to pay for the benefits for I, retirees. The only thing I say this is, I call it trickle up, not trickle down. You gotta create right. five dollars of value to put a dollar in your pocket. That's, you want to help the middle class, get another guy, create five more dollars of value, get another Steve Jobs, get another Bill Gates, get another Microsoft. You're going to create a lot of value for other people. It's trickle up. It's not trickle down. We learn trickle down. They, they propagandized us in the third grade. Okay, I refuse to use their propaganda term. Right. It is trickle up. Well, on, that, on, that <laughs> note, on that note, we can... Uh, we should end this conversation, and I, uh, I'm, I'm sorry for using that propaganda, but I gave you a chance to correct it, so that was good. Ed Cotter, thank you for joining me on Conversations, uh, and thank you for joining us on Conversations today.